Well, welcome here to Bay Legends. My name is Simon Russell, and we have Zena Escobedo hey. and, uh, as my co-host. And uh, I got to say, we got a special guest today, someone who I have had the play- pleasure of uh, playing with, and this is Mr. M- Mike Rinta. How are you doing, my brother? I'm good. Glad to be here, man. Oh, man. This yeah. is a pleasure for me, man. I've, I've really, uh, really, really loved your playing for many years. Right back at you, man. <laughs> so we wanted to bring you on here. The whole point of this show is to kind of talk about um, the behind the scenes. You know, you've played with a lot of incredible people over the years. And uh, we want to kind of get a bird's eye view of what it's like to to play behind a professional or lead a band. I mean, that would be really cool to hear. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you've been doing um, over these years? Wow. Well, I've <laughs> I've been doing I've been playing music and it's been my sole source of income, you know, either playing trombone or writing and arranging for yeah. over 30 years. Mm-hmm. And it was like my my dream. And I started to, to do it when I was like young. I was like, you know, I was uh, 30, uh, 22 years old when I got my first wow. gig and have been doing it like that long, starting playing salsa, you know, wow, of you all started things. The Latin, yeah. Latin. Yeah. Field. Yeah. Playing a lot of, you know. Wow, yeah, you that's know. amazing. But I grew up in a musical family. Okay, and now, uh, now tell us about that. Were you what kind of things would go on? You'd have uh, what people playing jamming every night, or what was it? Going on? Well, yeah, my you know it was mostly around the holidays, you know, gotcha. and um, you know my uncle Ron was a Hammond organ player. He he. Really? Um, Really great B three player, and he was kicking bass with his left hand, and and we used to jam on, um, you know, like Booker T tunes. I remember, you know, Sidewinder, and Uh, we played like Winchester Cathedral. Wow. You know, uh, you know, uh, Green Onions. Of course. All those songs grew up, you know, and everybody played something. My dad played trumpet. My cousin played the drums. Oh, my uh, cousin's boyfriend was a guitar player. My grandmother was an organist. She actually her gig was playing the pipe organ over at the at the uh, the, the Paramount Theater for silent films way oh, back wow. in the day. That's kind of incredible. Back in the day. And yeah, it was cool. And so there's you know a lot of organ and piano in the family. And and I know so. you play a little uh, organ yourself. And you I started out on organ and uh, and became a pretty proficient ragtime piano player. Wow. I think I was nine when I heard Scott Joplin being played and just totally fell in love with it. And oh, man, that stuff is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, Nothing but respect, man. When well. you're young, you can pick that stuff up pretty good. <laughs> and I could do it, actually. I was, I was really good, had really good, you know. It's n- weird now trying to, you know, sit down and go into B3 playing because with the stride, my right hand went on automatic pilot. Right. And I would focus on jump in the intervals with the left yeah, hand killer. Yeah. and then like when you want to play b3 you got to go the other way around you want to put your left hand on automatic pilot right. and kick the bass lines and then be mindful of the so it's kind of a weird kind of switch in the brain it, it you is. know it yeah is. now now tell me this um you've had an opportunity to play with some heavyweights you know, in your career. And I, I was wondering if you could share with us some of the people you've had a chance to play with. It's probably going to take us all, okay. all hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, yeah, I'm very grateful, you know, and I, I, I usually don't talk about these, you know, cause I don't want to, I don't like to boast cause well, there's for. something Every about, yeah. Likes to boast. Come on. Yeah. You know, you know, but I've, I've had a very, very blessed career you know you know i've been actually most recently been working with jimmy vaughn and i just absolutely love that gig it's gotta be awesome and uh you know and that's like blues royalty and oh for god's sake yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. we've been vaughn's brother correct yeah yeah Yeah. we played at the uh um all of his belongings were in storage for for 28 years really and his wife jimmy's wife uh pulled it all out and put up a big ex you know an exhibit and it was the first time any of it was seen in public you know his amps and his clothes and his handwritten you know his guitar straps his guitar with all the scratches all that stuff was kept and jimmy just kind of sat on it you know that's amazing he really loved his brother man 
That, and that's a rough, rough and loss. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, so we were lucky to uh, to do the thing down at the. I think it was at the Grammy Museum. It was mm. like a Mm-mm. a big showcase down in L.A. It was yeah. kind of a big, you know, a oh, big deal. It's huge, man. And uh, yeah. So now, did you play with? Um, you played with the marvelous Herbie Hancock. Well, yeah, that was like in 1995. It was a long time ago. I got called one day. Carl Parasso called me one day. He says, hey, man, you know, I want to get you on a, on a Santana gig. Wow. And, um, and so George is going to call you in about 10 minutes. He's like like 9 in the morning. He calls me. He says, you know, so we wanted to prep. And so George Jorge called. And, uh, and he says, hey, yeah, you want to go down and play this gig down in, in L.A.? And, uh, and it was... Uh, you know, it was uh, like a who's who is. So it was it was um, everybody, you know, Herbie. Hmm. And the horn section was me, Malesio and Bill Ortiz. Of course. And, uh, you know, we went over and, you know, rehearsed, uh, you know, the songs that we're going to do over. I guess Carlos had a, a studio over in San Rafael. And he was very nice. He gave me like a really cool, like one of those Michael Rios shirts with Miles Davis on it, and Aww. gave me some homemade incense. And uh, and we rehearsed and did the show. And um, and it was like a so many great people: Bob Weir, John Lee Hooker, Senior, mm-hmm. um, uh, Buddy Guy, Wow, Wayne Shorter, Wayne Shorter, yeah, Linda Tillery. <laughs> You must have. I did. Were you, I mean, what was going through your mind when you're? I mean, these are people you, I'm sure you would. Well, I grew up just worshiping these guys. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was really cool. And uh, and and I made some kind of comment about knowing your limitations because I'm a trombone player. I you know I I think that the trombone is limited. But the two of them, they 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 both said there are no limitations. Mm-hmm. And I was really like struck by that. I was yeah. like, wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, you know, that's kind of it is. It is deep. And and now, you know, I kind of really understand where they're coming from, you know, because they're in the meditation and right and and doing all that. And I, you know, I've spent my whole life trying to really understand what is it that gets in the way of that flow, because there's like a magic flow that that happens. And it just, you know, and it's yeah. And and you're like in the zone and the moment you go, oh, wow, I'm in the zone. Then, bam, the door shuts to it. And, you know, and and that's just, you know, just how it is. And so learning how to understand it and learn how to, you know, to, to help that door to open and to stay open without getting all messed up on. But you know, getting messed up on it is just simply human. Yeah, you know, jazz, baby. it is. It's <laughs> it's it's you know, you know, right, it's it's jazz, you know. Right. I I see it. You know, I mean, we you know, we have a left and a right side of the brain. A lot of you know creativity comes out of there, and then of course there's the survival instincts where the ego is. You know, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? Yeah, you know, all that kind all going of stuff. On at so, the same time. everything's yeah, going on. At the yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. speaking of cerebral and uh, mixing those two, you have to be probably one of the premier arrangers in this area. I mean, I've heard some of your arrangements, and they're just ridiculous. Mm. Um, can you kind of delve into, like, what's, what goes into the mindset of that? I mean, are you, like, just scoring this out of the top of your head? or <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's I can, like, toil with it. For a long time and you know it's 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 just kind of the creative process when i get into that flow yeah. and it's like bam all the best stuff just comes out all at once i remember and, working yeah. with you on that um we were working for paula harris we were uh-huh. working on some stuff and um i think i hummed something and you go, oh, that sounds and good. i went and like you're, you're, oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <You> get, <laughs> and he just had a thin air he goes yeah, and then he just writes it down. I'm like, wait, you don't need to know what key it is? Uh, you know, you just like, you hear it and, and transcribed it right there. Oh, it's really, it's really well, amazing. Whatever, it's a gift. That you is know, a gift, man. It is, it, it's, it's a gift and, and yeah, it's, it's fun, you know, but. No, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I was really in awe. And it was, you know, I hope that we get to do some more of that. That's of a, course, yeah. I would love to do more of that, yeah. yeah that, i got to get a chance to yeah. do some writing with you on that. Um, hey, Zena, you got any uh, questions for uh, this guest? You've been well, I called my father last night, and I said, Pops, and I said, you got to give me some gossip, some something on Mike. And he <laughs> says, I, I don't have nothing. He's a good guy. I can't. And I said, you know, any drug stories, any, you know, yeah. he, some liquor stories? He goes, no, nothing. 
And I said, oh, man, he goes, but (laughs) just tell him I said hi. And so, but you played on my father's last album. He had me write, I think I wrote four arrangements for it, and he gave me about like two weeks to do it. (laughs) And I was like so nervous. It's like, whoa, Pete Escovino, (laughs) you know, and it was really great. And, and, uh, and of course, Fortunately, I was I got into the zone and wrote all that stuff and yeah. and they flew me down and got to record on all that stuff and we're with Peter Michael and yeah and uh, yeah it was a great experience I'm really honored and it turns out we did uh, the whole Bobby Caldwell uh, what what you that won't do for love is that incredible. the song you did yeah that's one of them yeah dude okay let me just say this can you um, can you tell us the name of that record because people got to hear what you back did. to the bay back, back to, to the, the bay. bay. Yeah, <laughs> y'all, gotta, y'all gotta pick that, this record up and listen to the arrangements. It's second to none. I've never it's heard ridiculous. Never heard oh, better horn arrangements in my life. Well, literally, <laughs> wow, really, really it, flattered me. It was just yeah, incredible to me. That was my father's best album. It's, really? It's, yeah. Wow. And, I, and I'll tell him. I mean, we of course always talk. Yeah, about I him. love. Yeah, I'm so grateful every time I get to work with him. And, yeah, and, and Peter so Michael. He's you know, royalty. Just, both yeah. of them. Uh, you, the whole family is royalty. Well, it you is. know, it's so. just it's just the way that you know he dresses more than anything. His closet is just ridiculous. <laughs> <I> but <laughs> well, we're talking. We he's have, a classy have. dude, man. He is. He really is. He's he a class really act. Is. Well, you know? Zena, you know, somebody Zena, I really admire, you know. Yeah, Zena, it, it's just that's just her family, so she's kind of like, well, whatever. It's I mean, the, I mean, I'm used to it. It's you just, know? it's just Pete. <laughs> Peter Michael, whatever. <laughs> what, it's just one of those things. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, so then he was, so then I called my brother also, and I said, I said, hey, I said, you know, what's going on? I always call them late at night, especially the night before, you know, we're going to interview someone, and so I told him who was coming on. And So th- for, for one thing, everybody said to tell you hello. Everybody just said hello. Yeah. They were happy that you were coming on, and, yeah. you know, and so they were really excited. So my brother, Peter Michael, he said, ask him about his, the, the, the parents meeting his biological parents i said oh, oh yeah. my god so i heard about this this is just an incredible story so you have to let people know cuz the is just yes it just has to come from your mouth it's well it's 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 really amazing that, that they get it. it's a very emotional thing for me i can hear you i'm sure you hear it in my voice I gotta stuff it, that though. down really quick no 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 but i love that's <laughs> what we <laughs> that's what we do here we're just family yeah. and friends and you know yeah well you know um when you're adopted it puts a scar on you it, it yeah. really does it, it it affects you know you really because you're raised in a family and there's no real um genetic ties to to who you are so it's harder to see yourself mm-hmm. who you are and you grow up being who you know you think you're supposed to be or trying to fit in with your family you're always trying to fit in and um so I don't know. My sister had found her parents first, her because we were both adopted. We were both raised in this family, and they were g- great parents. They did a good job. Mm-hmm. You know, we were always provided for. Always had clothes. Always, you know, made it to school. Always had food. You know, yeah. so it was a good good upbringing. Um, but you know, there was always. Um, I always had a need to to dissociate. You know, mm-hmm. had a hard time. You know, I never really felt like I fit in, mm-hmm. and. Um, and you know, everywhere and uh, anyway so my sister found her her family first and i said uh it was like at a christmas dinner and i says you know i think i'm gonna make the search and my mom says oh you want a name and i'm like what mm. wow and she says yeah do you want a name and i says yeah and she says claudia fullerton and then bam i had this like rush wow. of chemicals flowing through my body that was like the most intense thing I had ever ever felt in my whole life mm. and um, uh, yeah it was a trip mm. so um, so it, it pretty much I was shut down I, I couldn't eat I couldn't think mm. I couldn't play music couldn't do anything except for obsess about the name and I did a Google search and it came up on Facebook as wow. a woman living in Pleasant Hill so close yeah so close <laughs> and i'm thinking nah can't be and so i actually i, I spent the money to have an, a you know a, a search done and found that there was three claudia fullertons nationwide one in the midwest who was uh about f- in her mid 40s another one on the east coast that was in her 80s but the one here in pleasant hill was in her mid 60s mm. and so i sent a letter to her on facebook and it says you know 
you know, I wrote this really nice letter saying, you know, I know it's a difficult question, you know, but I was, my name's Mike Renta, I'm a professional musician, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm searching f for, you know, my birth mother and, uh, turns out she has the same name as you. And if any chances you mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. person, and I got the reply about two hours later. Oh my God. It said, that like, would have been just yeah, yeah. <laughs> It says, um, yeah, Eureka, you found me. Wow. Mm. You know, mm. I'm so filled, you know, I'm so, f you know, <laughs> you know, it was just really intense. And yeah. she mm. said to call her, you know, and, um, mm. you know, I, um, I called her and we, s we, s we met the very next day <laughs> oh my and gosh. we had our first hug and, and it was, uh, just so intense just being able to hold her and touch her. And mm. know that she's real. Like That's you, your blood. you know. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like weird because I always grew up. My mom was great. You know, you know, you hug your mom, and it was always felt like something. And I hope my mom doesn't see this, <laughs> <laughs> but it always felt like something I was obliged to do. Mm -hmm. right. Something I have to do because it's something that you're supposed to do. But you know, when I met Claudia, it was like, you know, I really, really mm. wanted to just grab on and hold and just kind of just melt into her. You know, it was. It's a did this you see really features of uh, her face that look like yours right yeah, away? Yeah, you you see you can see some of the family stuff. You wow. look there's a wow. photo if you look on Facebook with me and my sister and yeah. her and you know we all kind of look the same. Mm. <coughs> now this was not that long ago. This was uh, this what? was nine years ago. Nine years ago. Yeah, because I was I was um, on Facebook and I remember you posting it and I it brought me to tears. I got to be honest. Yeah. I was like right with you and I felt it because it was. You know, when you see someone you work with and you're close with, and they, you just see them just, you know what I mean? It was one of the most yeah. powerful yeah. events in my mm -hmm. entire life. Yeah, and it was also, yeah, hands so down, the most healing event. Feeling it again, man. You know. that's, that's, that was pretty deep, right? <laughs> I know. Yeah, me yeah. too. That's, <laughs> that's just, <laughs> just amazing. You know. I mean, yeah, just, no, just amazing. Just, I yeah, love that. I, I feel so I love that. love, man. Yeah. When, so what age, oh, so when you, when your mom told you, um, when you said that you were going to find her, and she gave you the name. When, what age were you when that happened? Well, I was, I think I was 46. It was nine years. So I'm 55 now. And, and so I was 46. And, wow. uh, yeah, and it's, 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 it's a trip. All that, you know, and what I've learned since then, you know, when we're babies, we don't have, like, full memory. But mm -hmm. we, our sense of smell is fully developed, mm -hmm. and our sense of hearing is fully developed. So right. we, we could be in the womb and digging on the sounds of our mother talking mm -hmm. and, and any kind of music that might be playing. And we pick up on that as yeah. we're, you know, as we're developing, mm -hmm. but we don't have memories, you know, my earliest memories go to when I was about 18 months. And I remember being oh. read to out of a book about you're special, you're chosen, you're an adopted oh and we're going to go and we're going to wow. go pick out a sister for you. And she's chosen. So I remember doing, that. I remember going and, and that to the, young. yeah, I remember though that young going and picking out, you know, the sister, s seeing her for the first time. Mm. And, you know, I remember the waiting room and going down a hallway and all that kind of stuff. So, and how, how what is the age difference between you and your sister? Two years, two years. So you're kind of close in. Yeah. She was born in 67 okay. and I was born in 65. So, yeah. Wow. Um, so, but, um, yeah, so you don't, you don't remember, you don't remember being taken from your mom, which is actually, it's pretty traumatic mm -hmm. and yeah, it creates yeah. a type of, um, a PTSD, like a, pre, uh, uh, it's like a pre-development, pre-developmental kind mm -hmm. of thing. So but that makes know, sense. You know, yeah. Here's a, another thing is, is that yeah. probably the musician that you are is somewhat connected to that trauma. Well, yeah, you know, I, I mean? know. It's like yeah. I think, you know, a lot of the best yeah. musicians have come out of these kind of situations, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of interesting. You know, if you didn't have that, it, you might not be the same. Well, I wouldn't have worked so hard at what I do to be as best as I can. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> For sure. I, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know, I mean, so and there, and there's blessings all around in their yeah. own way, you know? Well, you know, there's also, there is talent in my, you know, you know, cause apparently my grandfather, my mom's father was a singer who had a, a scholarship for Juilliard and he didn't go because of World War II. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and then when I met my genetic dad, maybe about eight years ago and, you know, he flew out to California 
and and I took him up to meet my daughter, and they had a piano, and he's like this nerdy. He's <laughs> he, he was a scientist, you know. <laughs> So he's like, you know, his real nerdy, intellectual, real smart guy. And um, and he sat down at the piano and started playing uh, What I Say. And I'm like, going, whoa, oh, just okay, like, just Ray. like totally, totally blew me away to, to hear him. Yeah. So wow. he, he liked to sing and play a little guitar and all that. You know, he doesn't do wow. much of it now, but, you know. That's and amazing. Did she did she see you play yet? I'm sure. At a oh, concert. yeah. Like when was her first time of seeing you you might have been there there was a thing on april fool's day uh with elvin bishop i did i played with him at some i don't know if yeah I at that at, 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 at it, it's at hobie's in um in you um in concord yeah in concord oh, yeah, i was there yeah well, that, she was there yeah, she she oh showed up. God. Yeah, that was her oh first wow. time to see me play that. And what did she yeah. say? Uh, oh, oh, she loved it. That's she, she that's loved nice. it. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. Oh, that was a nice show too. Yeah, yeah that was a good show. That was fun. Elvin he probably played yeah. his heart out like he was four years old. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now tell me this. I, I I don't mean to switch the gears, but music is somewhat synonymous with a lot of uh, drug use. People can get into kind of get hooked into that lifestyle. Was that ever an issue with you? Did you ever get a... You know, from the beginning, you know, I mean, um, you know, it was in my family. Okay. It used to break my heart when my Uncle Ron, who was the, the, the foundation of our family, when he, you know, I would always look forward to going and play music, and at some point he got to be where he would be so drunk he'd be passed out on the floor. So his uh, choice... By noon. Was, his choice was alcohol, but I'm sure there's... Yeah. Everyone has their different you know yeah and well he was the one that got me sober he was actually sober but i think i was about i was 11 i started smoking cigarettes by the time i was 13 i was doing at least a pack a day and you know and started smoking pot and i loved pot man (laughs) pot was you know right i i this is like this is the best i want to be an old man and share a (laughs) joint with my grandkids you know (laughs) kind of thing you know it was i just loved it it. It and then and then when i drank for the first time it was like wow this is great and i had the phenomena craving right from my very first drink Mm -hmm. and it also runs in my genetic family so my my genetic mother is alcoholic Mm -hmm. and she was actually uh, 21 years sober. No, 19 years sober when I met her. So, That's a blessing. so wow. there's a there's a genetic disposition to, you know, I think drinking and possibly to getting sober. You now, know? What, what part of uh, the musical process helped you uh, get through that process? Well, you know what, I had no life or career. I was completely not functional. Gotcha. Um, all those years uh, when I was drinking and using, and I I went down really fast. And I, I was just uh, smoking PCP, and, and in the end, I was getting into smoking crack. And I'm, like, 22 years old. Wow. Mm. And, you know, and, uh, and, and I had it made. I had a house in Berkeley that, you know, I was living there. Um, we had toga parties. Mm. And, and I always had, had beer, had pot, had all that kind of stuff. Mm. And... Um, and and a, r- a house full of women and people partying and playing music and I'd be like totally lonely and alone mm. yeah. and just wanted to just get more wasted you know when I came home and when I finally <coughs> started hearing voices and uh and having like some really bad mood swings I'd be really high and grandiose and really low and suicidal and yeah. uh, and Christmas Eve I um I I bought a BART ticket with the intention to go electrocute myself on the third rail. Wow. And wow. I, I chickened out. And that was Christmas Eve, 1987. Jeez. Wow. And uh, the next day was uh, Christmas Day. My dad calls up and he says, hey, you know, are you coming over? We're expecting you. And I'm all like, no. And I think for the first time I admitted, you know, I think I might have a problem with drugs and alcohol. Wow. And uh and uh well he says well why don't you come over and talk to my brother which was my uncle ron who was a huge you know he's a physicist at sanford <laughs> actually he was on a team that that got a um what they the uh i just posted it 
you know, they, they, they uh, built the first bubble chamber, which was, you know, major in, in discovering particles, uh, some, some elementary particles. You got a lot of smart people. I, in I got family. a lot of smart people <laughs> in my family. <laughs> and uh, and they, 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 you know, but anyway, he was sober six years at that time wow. mm-hmm. and taught me about, you know, taught me about, you know, 12 step programs and said, that, you, you know, you should um, go before you change your mind. Yeah. And and yeah. something about that really rang true, and I went, and um, and it was like in my second month of sobriety when I got my first gig, full time wow. gig, <laughs> playing with the Franco Brothers of all oh, things, and Jesus. you know, and and you know, and and just kind of like made a life, you know, working three to four nights a week, and you know, I, I at that time I was a trombone player who worked at a pizza company, right. and uh, you know, just like the jokes, right. and uh, and uh, you know, I one day just quit my job. You know, wow. got frustrated. You know, there's just drama at work. You know, yeah. did it did uh, because I'm I'm not even sure if this is a silly question or not. But did music sound different to you, being sober or? I had to learn how to play sober. Wow. It was it was like it was a, a whole nother thing. I had to. Um. It's yeah. It's. You know, I had to learn how to do it, you know, I mean, you know, and, and I, actually, I think I'm a lot more free and open to it, mm-hmm. sober, you know, because I think what it is, and I kind of, you know, I've relapsed a few times, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, we talked at the very beginning about having that free and getting into the zone. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, what blocks that zone is fear. Right. The judgment and all that, or ego. Right. You know, you, you could be like playing and you're in the zone and you're having the night of your life and you go, wow, I sound pretty good. And then, bam, that flow shuts off. It just shuts off. Mm-hmm. Or you could be having a bad night going, wow, I sound like shit. And that, that door ain't going to open at all. Right. And um, so that's all ego. And that's mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. when you're in the zone, it's the absence of, you know, it's 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 called humility, I guess. That's probably the, ha- yeah. having a genuine state of humility. You know, it's, it's interesting you, know? you saying that. It's interesting you say that because I, I know that back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, especially near the 50s and 60s, a lot of the, you know, the musicians, the hit, hard hitters would started taking heroin, and mm-hmm. b- they thought, you know, like someone like, some of the greats, they thought that's how you, you know, like Charlie Parker. Yeah. They thought if you want to sound like this guy, you got to do what he's doing. So yeah. a lot of guys got on the junk thinking that's how you get, get into that zone and didn't realize that it was such an, Im- just like an incredible price to pay. You're going to, you know, and, and I heard stories of Charlie Parker just, just leaning on a, um, you know, on his amp or leaning on something and then they'd give a solo and he'd go nuts. And then he just kind of slumped back over. He was so out of it. But um, it, for me, now I got to say this: I've um, I had very little experience with drugs. Um, I was uh, the only thing that I had was music, and that's no judgment call on you. That yeah, I just yeah. I just didn't even have the access to it really. And so, but I was very alone. I was the only African American in the whole city. Yeah. And so. Um, I got beat up a lot and jumped and all kinds of things. What so city was this? This is Sebastopol, not known for being uh, up north. Well, yeah, but no it was just shit. it was just it's countryside, you know. Yeah. Um, so my music was the only thing that I had. So I just locked myself in the room and I just played piano all day. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I'd see the kids playing out there and I had no one to play with, but that was my drug. Yeah. You know. I hear you. And so um, I think to myself. How many of the people out there are trying to get the same high that we get from music? You know what I mean? Yeah. That good night of music when you when your music is right on and you just high for a month. You're like, man, I just had a great night. Um, people are trying to replicate that in some cases, you know. And so um, I guess I just never needed to do it because I was just high all the time mm. off the music. You know what I mean? But yeah. I think that. Wait, I don't want to be left out of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something? Yes. I have a good drug story. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Okay, so I I, you might have to take this out, but this is funny. So my <laughs> father, you know, because everybody was doing drugs in the 70s, right? Because that was just the fun thing to do. So <laughs> there was, so this is how I learned about drugs. There was tons of coke 
on the front room table. And so I went <laughs> downstairs and, you know, and so my father, my sister, my brothers, you know, because everybody, I mean, every musician came over, you know, at uh, East 21st and we lived on Geranium in Oakland. And, but, you know, that's that's just what you did. Mm. It was it was no different from the person down the street or five miles. Like everybody was doing coke, having fun, smoking weed, drinking. <laughs> like you said, women all over the house and guys over the house. And, you know, and I had to go to school. Like, I'm like, really? How am I? <laughs> Everybody's going to bed at four in the morning. I have to get up in four hours. You got to be kidding. So I didn't even know <laughs> what it was. So I went downstairs. My father had. I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you how many lines of Coke that were on the front room table. So as a little girl, I knew that something was bad. I just didn't know what it was because everybody acted different when they took it. So I went downstairs and I and I just sucked in like just and I just went <gasps> and I went <gasps> and just blew all this Coke <laughs> all, over, all over the whole room. And it just looked like snow. And I was like, this is fun. So I ran upstairs because I. I knew I did something bad. And then, <laughs> so everybody's drinking in the kitchen, so they come in the thing, and I was the only, you know, child in there. And, of course, they I think that they heard or something, and all I heard was, Cena! And I locked myself in the room. So that's my drug story. I'm not being out of this conversation. I love it. That's a great story. <laughs> You're all yeah. sniffing off the floor at that point. Yeah, there, there's all those jokes about <laughs> with the, the dog hair, with the dog hair. Yeah, about the carpet in the back room at Caesar's Lab Palace. Rug. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> all right, let's let's do this. Let's take a let's take a break, and then I'm gonna let Randy sit in my seat. He's gonna all ask right. you some questions. All right. That was uh, a really uh, great, brother. Right on, man. What's up, everybody? Back here at Notes Music Academy. This is the Bay Legends Show. And guess what? We got Mike Renta in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we are definitely social distancing. We got the, I know Mike's got like a three-foot arm. I got a three-foot arm. We're good. Man, how you feeling, brother? Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. Glad to be here, man. Man, I was, that was just, it was so interesting hearing, you know, you talking with Simon and Man, what what a I mean I I we go back so far, man. It's like I just missed out on a, so much of your career, even though I've been following and hearing this and hearing that. But you know, it's just so good to see you. And uh, it's been a minute, yeah. It's been a minute, man. But we're gonna go back real quick and talk about you coming over with Mike Rose. Yeah. Coming over when I was producing and doing all these uh -huh. pop R and yep. B rap singing. Uh -huh. We had all kinds of stuff going, but yeah. man, you guys came through, and I, I always tell the story, because you and Rose, man, there's something about you guys. You got this chemistry, the tone, and it, you know, even though, I don't know how much you played with him ra recently or lately, but man, back in the day, you guys were the guys that always called. You'd come over and play on my little, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, I love Mike Rose, man, and, and actually, he's the one yeah. who got me into barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Mike Rose he, got me into barbecue. And, and me and Mike go back to 12 <laughs> years old. He was the first musician I played with outside uh -huh. of my father. Yeah. When I was playing jazz, you know, yeah. I only played jazz standards for like two years. And here he takes me to get into a band, and it's Mike Rose. Yep. The first guy I meet. Yeah. So I, yeah. But yeah, now wh what's up with the barbecue? Well, I, that's just what I've been doing since COVID came ah, down. I mean, right, you know, right, it's like, right. you know, when I did a big old, like, chunk of like beef ribs last yeah, night yeah yeah so are you pretty good at barbecuing yeah 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 <laughs> nah, I, um. well i you know compared to texas barbecue i gotta right. i gotta maintain my humility because nothing's as good as like the real the real texas barbecue but right, for around right. here yeah it's pretty good well that's good man so what else now with all these gigs being i mean it was so sad just how it kind of came right when we had all these gigs booked and then all of a sudden this fell and then it was going to be a little longer you know and how did you get through that or how are you getting through that? 
It was tough at first, you know. I mean, you know, I, I had really bad depression at first. You oh, take because I'm, you know, I too. I'm a bit of a workaholic man. Yeah. I gotta be busy. I yeah. I have to be doing. And when they took away my gigs and and the fear from having no income and all that yeah. kind of stuff yeah, really yeah. really uh, got me. And and then trying to get signed up with the unemployment was right. like that was a just a bunch of hell trying to get through because right. it's not cut out for musicians you know finally yeah. i got my tax lady on it so i finally got something going so yeah. but um yeah uh you know i i lost all interest in even playing my horn there was a few weeks i didn't touch my horn at all yeah and uh nor write i you know because i write in the range yeah, too i sure, couldn't do sure. any of that so right, it, it hit right. me pretty hard so it just kind of just the work just kind of slowed down and just gradually yeah yeah i i dived into doing 12 step stuff wow pretty much that was all there there was yeah. and uh you know and um and uh i so guess uh, i did start getting gigs though there's these people that are doing like social distance gigs right. house call jazz you can nice. have or it started out as house call jazz now right. it's called house call soul right. so you can have live music on your doorstep that's socially distant wow. so you can look at uh, housecallsoul.com that's awesome and yeah and so they saved my life yeah pretty much because they they gave me like a reason to play because right. i've been playing my trombone all my life and it's it's a job it's yeah, yeah. it's it's become a job and and i work at it really hard to do the physical things to right. play the instrument yep. you know which is all calisthenics you know yep. certain exercises how, how much do you still practice like on your on a daily routine about two hours i feel comfortable every day, with every day not much. every day on, on days where i have to gig i have right. a two hour roughly two hour routine that i like okay, to do so that, that'll get you loose and ready and fired up for the gig yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's just basic well, calisthenics yeah. you know to get everything and it seems like it seems like you know a lot of people have been doing a lot of internet for you know like where people are in different parts of the country or whatever have you been able to do any internet type of yeah I, uh, with uh with uh uh with uh steve lucky and carmen um they had me come on and we did like uh we played did a live facebook thing nice. and uh uh yeah you got to be creative in this time you know we can't just not do something we got to figure a way to do it you know yeah yeah and manny a friend of mine manny had me on his his podcast and yeah. interviewed me that manny, was a lot of fun it, Man, manny who? uh why am i blanking on his name sorry manny that's all right <laughs> god no that's it hey you can edit this out. Uh, you know what? Manny Burnell. Okay. okay. Sorry. Right, right. <laughs> okay. No, My brain is uh, the 5G. No, I don't know. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> My hey. brain doesn't want to work anymore. Hey, well, check it out, man. We gotta, <laughs> I, know, I know we got to talk about, uh, uh, you know, another situation where you came into the studio mm -hmm. with several groups over the years, but the one that I remember the most was... was uh, the Sly and the Family Stone. Yeah, and that was great. I loved playing with yeah. that. So in the, the Yates brothers, Skyler Jet. Yeah, you know, Skyler and Vet and Stone. You know, Vet it's, and it was and a great you know band. Cynthia. She's Eric passed. Moore, yeah. Uh, Stephon. Yeah, Spider. Yeah, man. And Tony. Uh, Wait a minute. Tony Wait a minute. Stead. Wait a minute. Did you just say somebody passed? Cynthia passed. <gasps> oh no! Uh, okay, I knew that. I knew that. Cynthia okay. Robinson. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't hear her because she's. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that was a trip. You know, she all she was the sweetest lady. I loved her, man. Yeah. And she was so funky. Yeah. She was. God, she was so funky. Yeah. And I, I remember once she she's said. She's a sweetheart. Yeah. You, Every time she came to that studio, she made sure she said hi and bye to me. And that's yeah. you know for at, you know at this time she didn't know me as a musician. She just knew me as a guy that owned Colorblind. You know. Yeah. That was it. But she always would talk with me and we'd always get into great conversations. Yeah. 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 And then she knew then she knew I played because I would be in there jamming when the drummers wouldn't show up, right? I know that all was all the groups were so fun. Yeah, that was the cool thing about that band yeah. is when the rehearsal was over, the guys didn't want to stop playing. Oh, yeah. And they're all two church musicians, right. you know? Yeah, yeah. So church musicians they they, they love to play and they don't right. stop, you know, and they right. just keep going. And that's what happens on Sunday too. Yeah. And and yeah, and that's the one thing that I really noticed when playing playing with them it was always like another like another climax or yeah. another it Ain't would nobody, always it would always build yeah, no, nobody was in a hurry to leave yeah and you know when you're when you're music you're playing and it always just felt like it was moving forward yeah. 
and and um and and it'd be a little bit of like overplaying but always in the right it was never stuff that got in the way right right you know because you got the other side of musicians that play just basic groove and time and sure. keep it really simple right and then you know and, and these guys they know how to spill and i i love i thrive on that yeah, yeah. it's like yeah, they you know fill in the gaps yeah and, and pete and tony were oh, really amazing together yeah and with both drummers sounded incredible you know yeah um but yeah, and then you got to go to Europe on that. How was that? With, uh, it was great. We played all the major festivals, Montreux Jazz Festival, uh, North Sea, Nice. Uh, we went everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Umbria, all big stages, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was great. It was an honor to get to go there. And, and, you and, know. and did I hear that, he, that Sly was contracted out of the whole show to be on stage for, now I heard 17 minutes. Is that possible? I was told 30 minutes in some cases and 45 minutes in other cases. Okay, okay. All right. And and that I got like right from the promoter, and he was really stressed out because Sly wasn't on for all that much time. Right, he, right. So because normally what, how long would he be doing a – He'd come on for what he felt. <laughs> <laughs> He would say, I'm an old man now. I got to take a fucking piss. Right. And and, and, that, <laughs> that, and that piss turned into a <laughs> 30 never minute, come back. Yeah, you but, know, 20 knocks but, on the door. Can you come out and sing a song, Sly? Uh, yeah, yeah, you got any toilet paper. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. All right, but anyways, yeah. It was so, great to... And then, and then, like, who else did you get to play with that, that took you around the world? Oh, um, the first time I went around the world was with Michelle Shocked. And that was like in in ninety five, and that was great. Oh, wait a minute! She had a hit. She had a hit. Uh, which one was that? The song oh, that she had. I don't know. She had a, a lot of hits. She was really was big on. When I was young, she was really big on MTV. I know. That's what I'm saying. And uh, and yeah, had a really big following. But yeah, we we had all this, and the rhythm section there was like Carl Wheeler and Jamie Brewer and Whoa. Joel Smith, Whoa. and me and Rich Armstrong on horns. Wow. And what a band. What You yeah, know, I mean, yeah. it was like another really spectacular. Carl Wheeler is a piano player. Oh, I know Carl. Yeah, Carl oh, yeah. always amazed me because yeah, he would take he would take progressions in Maze. ways which I never knew were possible. Oh, yeah, no, Carl's, it's a, like, Carl's a beast. That's, he taught all the guys. David Jackson learned from him. Um, all them cats, man. LJ, all those guys. Yeah. But yeah, man, that's great, man. So you just got this wide, versatile thing. I knew it, man, from way back in the day because I remember you could play anything. We'd be on a gig playing some Earth, Wind, and Fire. We'd be playing some Motown. We'd be playing some blues. We'd be playing some rock stuff, and it was like just you know you could play well, anything. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I yeah. wanted to be able to play professionally. Yeah. I wanted to be able to make a living, and I also knew that I would have to. Um, be versatile to be yeah. able to play any yeah, st- to in, and really it's a language if you listen you can play it you know and right. I I mean I could play okay jazz but I don't really consider myself a jazz player you know right, right, I right. mean I mean I could go out and do it and I enjoy doing it I enjoy playing standards and doing all yeah. that kind of stuff but you know I just do whatever you know I I try to do what the gig calls for and yeah, I yeah. try to play appropriate for the style and sure and you know and I listen to jazz and I love I listen to salsa I listen yeah. to you know all that you know yeah and we were going to talk about the Pacific Mambo, Mambo Orchestra Orchestra yeah 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 I, now I haven't heard them live but I've heard some of the uh, songs, and they're yeah. very good. And they, they won, you guys won some awards. Right? We won our first record, uh, the first CD won a Grammy. We a got Grammy, Tropical Latin right. Album that's of right. the Year. Christian was and talking and about Yeah, that. and that was uh, caught me, blindsided me. I Because we were up against Mark Anthony and Sergio George. And, and you know, and, and uh, you know Larry Batiste told me, he says, hey, Mike, you got a pretty good chance. And I'm wow. like, nah, we're yeah, not going to yeah. do this. and. And then, of course, I'm on my way to a gig, and Anthony Paul called me and says, "Man, you won the Grammy." I'm like, "Man, stop messing with me! You know, you're you're you're, you're lying." You know, he says, "No, you really did." Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it was like, "Wow!" And it's like it was like a miraculous kind of thing because we're like this small band that nobody ever heard of. Well, it's a big band; it's a yeah, yeah, yeah. 21 piece orchestra. Yeah. But nobody, we had a ten thousand dollar budget. Wow. And and somehow. We managed to, to you know pull why? this off. Because it was good music and people loved it and 
you were in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I, I imagine so. Unbelievable. Yeah, man. yeah. You know, and you know, it, and, and we were talking earlier about arranging, and, and one of the songs I wrote on that album was El Cantante, and I didn't want to write it at all because it's like it's a standard. Yeah. Hector Laveau. It was written by Reuben Blades, mm -hmm. and and uh, and it was a standard. Everybody does it, and they says, "No, we want to do it." And so I transcribed the whole original version, mm -hmm. and uh, in the original key, and uh, and then they said, "Oh, well, uh, the girl singer is going to sing it," and I'm like, ah, "She does it in D minor." I'm like, "Fuck!" So I revoiced the chords and and did they they were either too high or too low and at that point i got pissed off yeah, yeah. and this is after toiling over it for like six months oh. and when i got pissed off i sat down with it and the whole first half of the song came out in like 14 hours wow it just like it is just like it was just there it just like Wah. yeah yeah and hey, then i wanted to ask you too um when you approach as an arranger okay say somebody sends you a track and they don't they just say Mike, I need you to put some horn, horns on this. How do you go about it? Well, I mean, do you they're, have to get they the come guys? to me because they want a horn arrangement. Well, of you course, know? yeah. But, I mean, do you, ha do you have to call the guys or to, to set if they want a whole Sometimes, horn yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just did uh, down at Greaseland, mm -hmm. Kid Anderson, uh, you know, the Noel Hayes, who's a DJ in town. Yeah. He, he went around and found all. He go went into the hood and found these, like, really cool singers. And, you know, Frank Bay was one of them. He just passed. Um um uh willie we willie uh walker was one yeah, of them yeah. he just passed wow. and so we got this other guy named sonny green who put out like maybe a whole bunch of 45s back in the day never recorded like a a full like lp right. so we're in there we're doing a full a full lp and he says hey i want you to write this i want you to just do do horns just take it over the top do whatever you do charge me what you want to charge me and <laughs> and hire a horn section and we'll do it you nice, know nice. and and so i had about two weeks just like for pete's dad <laughs> i had about yeah, 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 i mean yeah. for pete yeah, yeah. For, yeah. so yeah yeah so um you know, I had about two weeks to write and and, you know, got it all done. And, and you know, and the magic fortunately happens. Right. Right. And uh, we got we uh, we recorded nine songs last Saturday. Man. And uh, so that's going to be out soon. It's it's amazing. This yeah, record is like really good. Demar's on it and, yeah. you know, Kid Anderson and yeah, yeah. and, you know, not sure who the guitar, you know, who's playing guitar. I think Jimmy Pugh's on it. Oh, OK. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's going to be really yeah, great. That's awesome, man. So, so again, so like when, when you're writing for a part, now I want to ask you like, how do you, if some, if it's scratch, scratch track, are you, how do you hear the part? The song writes itself. To me, it's just something that kind of manifests. When I, I hear, okay, there's a space. I listen to what all the different instruments are playing, right, and, and just rhythm, try it. Rhythm, yes, thing, yeah, right. and and I just and where the vocals are. And so just do you. So do you approach it like melodically, like a singer? Do you hear the first the, the melody, or are you hearing a harmony? Or how? I mean, that's what I'm. Trying I hear to all of that. Yeah, you know, yeah, I hear yeah. I hear a melody. I hear the harmonies. Uh huh. I hear, you know, the different kind of rhythms and all that kind of stuff. And so, so when you first hearing something, are you hearing like a uh, like a melody note, like a melody note type of thing, and then the harmonies come in after? You know what I'm saying? Well, I kind of understand the harmonies just because yeah. I was given um, a, a good education sure. on harmonies. And I've always made it a practice when I'm playing in a horn section to look over and see what the other horn players are playing. Right. And so I know that there's like a role yeah. that each horn has, you know, and, um, and there's certain ways to voice chords. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I try to think in terms of the melody and voicing down from the melody. I see. And, uh, and depending on what kind of horn section, how many horns you have, right. you might want to have closed voicings sometimes. You might want to have more open voicings, you, you know. Uh, the CD I did recently was four horns, you know, baritone, sax, trombone, tenor sax, and trumpet. Right. So, you know, and, you know, I just hear it. And, and when I'm listening to the track, 
I just listen to it, and then next thing you know, I'm like kind of singing and you know, kind of grooving along, right, right, right. and and you know, and then and then that's the stuff that I I want to capture and and put on, and right, right. and and you listen to it, and there's like a little spot. Well, this spot needs something here, mm-hmm. or this needs to be said here, right. or you need to do you this to take it in this, here. Right? Yes, this vocal part or yeah. this drum beat or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and the song that's writes awesome. itself. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, yeah. you know, and that that's really what I, how I'd rather, like, I like to consider myself as more being a channel for it. Right. Like, the music is coming through me yeah. and, and, and getting put on the paper and, and... Beautiful. Yeah. So do you feel like it's already written and then you're just writing it out? That could be a possibility. We, you know, this universe is a trip. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, True. you know... But it's probably yeah. like anything. Sometimes, like a melody, <laughs> sometimes a melody will come to me in five, ten minutes, like the whole song. Yeah, I just got it. Or sometimes I might have to sleep on. Like I'll work on the hook. I get the hook maybe, and that's yeah. it. I'm not hearing a verse yet. I'm not hearing. Maybe a couple of days later, I got the bridge. You know, and you put it together. You know, so yeah. I can imagine that being and thinking of all those parts it works like that as well yeah it's always different and sometimes you get totally blocked i'll be totally blocked and not be able to do anything and i can get hypercritical going nah that sucks that that sucks that sucks that's not right you know and i could do that for a long time now do you ever give like do you have like a maybe a partner or something around like like you'll kind of give a sample hey what do you think of this do you like this line or do you well that's cool when you can collaborate yeah, because yeah. you bounce ideas off of each right. other and sometimes magical things happen that you yeah, never yeah. even expected right. and and i love doing that yeah, that's yeah. that's always cool yeah. yeah it's great uh seeing you again you seem really happy man and just you know is there any other things uh, that you're doing right now through this time where we can't you know do you have have you found having this time you've like got any new hobbies well I'm Barbecue. I've been just, barbecue. yeah. I I was always on the road, man. I was on the road all the time. I never got to barbecue. I love to barbecue. So you just go shopping one week and barbecue every day. And yeah, stack it up. Go hit up Costco and get some pork bellies. I did pork bellies earlier this week. And See, this is what I did these. Mike Renter, we know you play and you're, you play well, with everybody. Okay, I'm going to be posting some photos oh, on what Facebook. Are, yeah, what's some other things you'd like to do besides playing music? I just play music. I do. I do twelve-step meetings. That's good. I do. I've started. A, you know, I'm really into a program called ACA, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics. Wow. So you know, um, you know, being raised works. in those kind it of works. families. How long have you been doing it? With that. Um, no, I mean just the whole. A- well, the whole the whole twelve-step thing, pretty much all my life. You know, I oh. I had no career in music before, you know, I got sober. You right. know, I mean, I was just. Right. I was just too out there and, and even for many years after getting sober. But, you know, uh, you know, yeah. I uh, I had some boo boo years, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I never got into anything. That's how we grow. Yeah, so, sometimes it is. It is. sometimes we resist growing. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, because, you know, it's not I, about you know, music. It's about the, the, the other things. we. Do I like, like good feelings. Things. I don't like bad feelings. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, hey, you know what? I, I love being positive, but sometimes you just got to dodge, you know, that negative negative energy well, it's gonna come in it's coming anyway yeah so you well, just gotta kind of well sometimes you gotta you gotta feel it and let it motivate you to do the things that you need yeah and sometimes you gotta grieve you know because sometimes there's losses you gotta grieve those losses well, we, we know and um and um you feel those things and then you move past them yeah. and and then you find a way to be of service or to help other people along yeah that's, you know. I, that's what I found kind of too. Like I over this COVID thing, I've been c- haven't been able to do too much besides getting into this show. We've been working on the show for a couple months and everything, but I, um, you know, just been uh, really spending a lot of time doing the creek thing, you know, and just doing different things, man. And it's been giving me a a, a real good peace thing. And I've been exercising and stuff like that. You mm-hmm. know, I never did that for a long time, you know, after the studio closed down. Are you, are you doing any, um, anything like that? Are you doing? I love yoga, oh. believe it or not. Right. Oh. And, um, I did some, um, a few days ago and I got to space it out because if I do too much of it, it'll mess me up. Right. right. But, um, I'm, I'm going to be going back on Thursday. That's awesome, man. I got to um, try that out. We, we want to, we want to see a pose. That's, 
Oh man. I, I oh, want to see a pose. Can we see a pose? I have to get on the ground. Okay, we got a ground. We have <laughs> one right no, no, there. don't, no, don't. No, no. Randy, can I'm, you do a pose? No, we're doing. We're gonna. I do gonna the, 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 the pelvic music. tilt. We're gonna stick with some music. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, he might be able to do a pelvic <laughs> tilt with that trombone, Zena. You might get some vibrations. <laughs> That's another <laughs> show, Randy. That's another <laughs> show. We can do a part three. Shoot, this is, this is, remember Notes at Night? Just keep Notes at Night, part three. <laughs> We're keeping this one in. What's, what's up with that trombone over there? Uh, it's my Shires, yeah? Man, that's beautiful. I love it with the hat there hanging there. This is the horn I bought just before working for Sly. Actually, really? I was working with Sly when I got this horn. And, really? And what yeah. year is it? 2007. Really? It's brand new, yeah. Or oh. it was brand new back then, man. Yeah, it's yeah. a great horn. How man. many how many trombones you got? <laughs> oh <laughs> I've lost count. Oh, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, 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 I got a ton of them. I got I got probably about three different shires, mm. tenor trombones. This is the tenor. Hey, this is important, man. Yeah. Because people want to know what you use, what type of mouthpieces and, and or who you're endorsed by, you know, and stuff like that. Let's talk Doug about Doug Elliott it. mouthpieces. He's go. a guy in Washington D C. He's nice. like the <laughs> he's the guy. No, he's the serious. guy. Yeah. You he's know. probably the guy I see videos on Facebook where they show the different mouthpieces of guy testing out stuff. Maybe? He's he's involved in that crowd. Yeah. And uh yeah, so you know, there's a yeah, so All right, so wait but, a minute. So three you said three shires. And then how what how many And then I got a Shires bass trombone, I got two king trombones, I got a flugel bone, I got a sousaphone and I have a tuba. Okay, to wait a minute. A flugel bone. Or no, bass trumpet. It's a bass trumpet, not okay. a flugel bone. Okay. It's, it's a I've bass it's a, it's a, a bass trumpet. It's like a trumpet on steroids. It's like yeah. twice as big as this. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Never, I've never seen one. I never even heard of it. Yeah. Amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I don't really play it that much, but yeah. But but you got it if you. I own it. Oh, yeah. But what you play tuba too, right? Yeah, I do gigs on tuba. Wait a second. Now you you do play? Didn't you play a lot with uh, jazz mafia? I did back in the beginning, yeah. That's right. And I also used to do all the Miles Davis "Birth of the Cool" things. Yeah, yeah. I played the tuba part on the "Birth of the I Cool" got, stuff. I got something. I don't know if you know this, but um, what's the cat's name that plays Bone Adam? Adam. Yeah. Okay, Adam. I I don't know him personally, but I've I've. How He's the guy. Know? He is Jazz Mafia. He's I the guy who that. started it. I yeah. know that, but you know what he told me one time? I mentioned your name. I think I was at one of the studios or something, and we crossed paths. But that for some reason, we started talking to you about it. He goes, hey, man, Mike Rint is the real real deal, man. He told me, he goes, quit playing that bone like a pussy. He goes, man, you got to play with more power. I did you say told, that. I, I, I regret told, that I said I that. I don't know if you said that <laughs> word, but I, I remember something. I think I used foo foo trombone. I mean, but, but yeah, he, but, was, but he, was, he was like, that was like. But we were he, playing. He appreciated it. Like yeah, well, I hope him. so, no, I, because I don't know. I don't think I really have any business telling people shit of, like that. Hey, but seriously. If we were in a salsa band and you got to. Play, you gotta play. You know, yeah. it's not a jazz group. You gotta, you know. Yeah. And but still, it, you. But you've had the but, honesty to tell him something that really helped him. He's a bad motherfucker. He I scares know. me, man. He's he's a I really know. great. I've heard him. And he's yeah. Versatile. He plays um, bass. Plays great bass. He writes great. I know. I know. And he's put together so many different projects. Right. All he's of a, them are really he's a experimental. We gotta we gotta bring and, him on the show. Oh, you definitely should. He yeah. would be a great definitely. addition for this show. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, man, is there anything uh, uh, else you want to talk about? Yeah, I want to know how many record labels. That you have been on. Oh boy, it's it's hard to say because I'm on countless records. The most, a lot of my stuff was on Wide Hive Records, which is right here out of, of Berkeley. But I've been fortunate to be recorded on the, on Motown, which is probably one of the biggest name, you know, thing. I did some yeah. um, who, stuff who with the doing? Monophonics. Oh okay. Um, and there was a guy, a, a, a really great soul singer, Ben La Uncle Soul, right, from right. France, who just amazing you know you look him up on youtube and you'll see like millions of views on his videos okay, and awesome. stuff he's really 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 great Definitely. so i wrote a bunch of horn stuff and some uh, string parts too and um and then i i've written for disney i did some stuff there's a genevieve goings I, you you remember the band santa esmeralda 
Yeah, and and Jimmy Goins, you know, he leads that. He's the lead singer. Right, okay. And we were touring, and he does the sound for the Pacific Mambo. Oh. J- Jimmy's a really super talented guy. Sure. But his daughter has been signed and doing a TV show for Disney for a long time. You know, um, I'm not sure about the, the name of the show, but she's like a conductor, and there's a train, a steam train, and it's a children's show. And wow. That's awesome. <laughs> So they had me write, and so I wrote, played some trombone and some tuba nice. on that, and so it's cool. I can boast to say I wrote for Disney. Yeah, but, yeah. But you know, I don't know. I it's 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 it's, I'm, you know, I'm on so many records and stuff. I've lost. And, that, and that's you know that that just goes to show you, man, that you know that you made some solid contacts. You kept those solid contacts throughout the years, and you know you've been, I've been hearing nothing but great things about you. And I love, I love, I'm not kidding, bro. That record with, uh, with Pops and everybody, Peter Michael. That was, I'm really honored to have been a part of it, it. yeah. Man, I'm telling you, that, and Cy Smith and just, man, just all those uh, horn parts you arranged, man, just funky, soulful. The, re- the record is just like, it is really amazing, you know, really amazing. You guys got to get that record, Pete Escovito. Back to the Bay. Back yeah. to the Bay. Yeah. Mr. Mike Rinter. Man, Mike, it's been a pleasure, man. It's good to see you again. I'm glad you got in touch with your 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 uh you know, your birth mom and you know, I know you met the sister and you know just Oh yeah, that. yeah. That's great, man. Met my genetic father. Turns out my whole family on my father's side, my eleventh great grandfather was an important Indian chief who went to London, England to have an audience with King George. Wow. So this is like way at the beginning in the United States, and his wow. picture is actually featured in the American Indian Museum in Washington, D.C. And then I got a, uh, so I'm part Cherokee Indian. I'm, That's You know, awesome. I got a, um, a 16th, yeah. so I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm eligible for Cherokee Nation. Man, that's just a and, trip. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you so have an incredible story. <laughs> right. It's a trip, a, man. Yeah, you can write a I book mean, about this. Right. You should. You should. That's what you yeah. should be doing, getting some ideas down. Because uh, it's an interesting story. And then, you know, so late, you know, uh, in the game. I mean, we're halfway through our life, you know. Yeah. And I might be past that. For well, you know, no. you might, you, <laughs> I might be too, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Well, let's pretend we're not right now. Yeah, okay, okay. we're halfway there. I'm going to live to be 110. Exactly. Hey, man, yeah. people are doing it, though, you know? Yeah. Yeah. People are. Yeah. People are definitely. It's weird, too, because it seems like we're getting, there's more things out there to catch now and all this stuff in this pandemic, and, you know, people are going to live to 120. <sighs> hey, Mike. Thank you so much. Okay. For thank you on. for coming on. I'm the show. really, truly honored, really grateful to be here. And, man, you know, thank you. You, you know, I, I really hope that what I gave out was oh, people are of use it. to somebody. Oh, yeah. You definitely. know, or there's, there's, there's it, at the least entertaining, people. you know. Yeah, for sure. You know, man, so thank you so I, much you know, for being on Bay It's Legends. an honor to be here. Yep. Thank, thank you, you Simon for having Russell. Me. Thank you, Zena Escobedo and MJ. Thank you so much, brother, for helping us out today. That is a wrap.